Hey, it's Cody Raul with Tech for Psych. So last video, I covered what was wrong with meditation research in the past, and I talked a lot in that video about the different progression of traits that these meditators have with time, the lifetime hours of meditative practice. I wanted to dive more into that in this video and parse out what is really the difference between a beginner meditator and an Olympic meditator, someone like a Buddhist monk that has 27,000 hours of meditative practice, and also theorize how we might be able to use technology to speed up that process a little bit to make all of us better meditators and have what Daniel Goleman and Richard Davidson called altered traits. But real quick, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and click that bell so you get notifications when I upload new content. Thanks so much for the support. Let's dive in here. So the first level of meditation, you know, I think that they're really talking about like if you got some meditative instruction for a weekend or a couple of classes on mindfulness meditation. Typically today, that would be more uh, applicable in the medical model. So um, in mental health treatment, for example, it's become uh, very popular to teach mindfulness techniques. And the reason why is because uh, people that are experiencing depression or anxiety, a lot of times they have no awareness of what's going on in their body. They don't realize that they're taking short, rapid breaths. They're not you know, breathing deep into their diaphragm. They're not uh, relaxing their skeletal muscles when they try to relax. These different uh, physiological things will cause them to have more uh, psychological distress. And having a mindfulness of what's going on in their body and in their brain can actually really enhance uh, their ability to uh, handle what's going on with them. So even just a little bit of instruction, like uh, I know at my hospital we have an intensive outpatient program where people just spend a week and maybe one or two of the modules will be uh, mindfulness practice and just learning cognitively what that is. That can actually have some um, immediate effects over uh, brain circuitry and body physiology. So um, the first thing that uh, a little mindfulness course like that can have for someone is management of stress, um, mostly related to the amygdala, the fight or flight response brain area that uh, activates the sympathetic nervous system. You know, I, I talked about this in my previous video, but like the prototypical example would be the cavemen in the uh, savanna seeing a saber-toothed tiger running after them. And, um, <laughs> that's where the amygdala gets activated. And when you do neuroscience studies with people exposed to stress or even like gruesome pictures, like the difference between seeing a picture of a fuzzy bunny and seeing the picture of a burn victim, the amygdala gets set off and people that have had some mindfulness meditation training, even a little bit of it, are able to decrease the level of amygdala activation pretty quickly. So that's definitely, uh, helps them. But what you see at the more advanced levels of meditation is that these people are actually able to decouple their whole neuronal structure from the in incoming stress and are much less affected from it. So beginning levels of meditation, you can have improvements in stress and also uh, pretty quick changes in attention levels. Like when you're training with the Muse headband right out of the box, like a general consumer, uh, it's going to increase your ability to have attention and you can measure that through different uh, brainwaves like EEG patterns and other cognitive tests. So you get pretty quick improvements of attention even after like just two weeks of practice with meditation, especially like Vipassana meditation where you're focusing on the breath. Uh, people report, and I'm reading off of my laptop on this one just because um, there's some details here that I haven't quite memorized yet. So uh, people reported improved focus, less mind wandering, and improved working memory just after two weeks of meditative practice uh, with a concrete payoff in uh, some studies actually sh showed uh, boosted scores on graduate level entrance exams which is really cool just from like two weeks of meditative practice uh, number three um, some protocols that showed that even after 30 hours of practice there was decreased markers for inflammation like cortisol um, so even there at the beginning baseline of meditative practice, you can immediately see some benefits from practicing things like mindfulness meditation and other types of meditation. But the thing that uh, Altered Traits talked about a lot is that these are very fragile changes, meaning that in order to sustain that effect, you need to be meditating every day. And even during the day, 
you know, those effects might be present after the meditation, but even by the end of the day are not as sustained. And that as you become more advanced in your meditative practice, uh, these traits, these uh, neurocortical uh, phenomena, phenomena that happen in your brain, like attention, uh, compassion, empathy, um, or stress handling improves with, with time, meaning that it uh, sticks with you for longer periods of time and is less fragile, more robust. So getting into people that are in the intermediate to advanced levels, meaning that you have something like a thousand lifetime hours. And this was another point that they made uh, really clear on in Altered Traits is that it matters how many lifetime hours of practice you have. So if you had a study and you had two people that said that they have 10 years experience of meditation experience, the 10 years doesn't matter as much as how many hours a day are they spending meditating? How many uh, meditative retreats have they gone on? And the typical measure that they spoke about is lifetime hours of meditation. Uh, it could also be important if they've had some coaching or have had some assistance on how to do the meditative technique properly. That Those people that had coaching went on retreats and spent more time uh, during those 10 years had much more pronounced uh, changes in their brain through neuroplasticity. So, so the intermediate to advanced people over the uh, beginner people showed better ability to decrease the amygdala activity after stress. So they're able to handle the stress much more quickly than the beginners. And then also they're able to decouple the upper brain neurocircuitry from the incoming pain response much quicker. And you can take a look at my previous video for more uh, in-depth discussion of that. But they have this uh, test where they can put this hot plate on the back of your hand and elicit pain without burning you. It's very painful. And they showed that the more advanced meditators were able to decouple their upper motor neurons in their brain from the lower motor neurons that were sending the pain up. So as you can imagine, that becomes very applicable to stress response in people that have hundreds, if not thousands of hours of meditative practice. So this is a different altered traits is this stress and pain tolerance. Uh, one thing that was apparent in people that have had that much meditation training is that uh, they actually showed changes in the default mode network. So beginner level meditators don't have this change in the default mode network as much, nearly as much as the people in the intermediate and advanced levels. And the default mode network has to do with the self-referential thought and this feeling of self. So the less robust connectivity in the default mode network, the more selfless the person is. So the more selfless the person is, the more that they are less concerned about their own narcissistic tendencies and more willing to be there for other people. And that becomes much more pronounced in this uh, thousand level, thousand hour uh, life meditation uh, level of uh, meditative practice. And then also they're able to show much stronger and robust activation patterns of uh, compassion and loving kindness circuitry in their brain, meaning that they were able to, if they saw a uh, child that was starving or suffering, it wasn't just a cognitive effect of like, oh, they're uh, starving. It wasn't just an empathetic response, meaning that they felt within their body the pain of the person that they were seeing. It was that they actually turned on compassion. So when people are beginning levels of meditation, the amygdala fires up and causes them to look away. Uh, more advanced, they get the amygdala fire up and they're able to decrease that and feel the sympathy towards them. But the more advanced practitioners were able to uh, have the amygdala fire up, dampen down that so they don't avert their gaze from the suffering person, and then elicit uh, compassion uh, networks within the brain that you would see in uh, a parent seeing their child in a loving, compassion way, having compassion for this suffering individual, and that being much more pronounced, especially people that have had uh, significant training and loving kindness types of meditation. So that was uh, the intermediate level, and what you also saw was hormonal indicators of lowered reactivity, uh, less inflammation, strengthening of prefrontal circuits for managing distress, lower levels of stress hormone like cortisol, and uh, increased telomere length in chromosomes. Um, it's a good way of showing uh, longevity in a person. The more stressed out we are day to day, the more it wears us down, uh, the quicker people age. So this actually showed that people that uh, had um, you know, like a Western practitioner with a, a busy day life, the day schedule life would have like, um, 
you know, a thousand lifetime hours, if they were regular with meditation, that, that they would generally uh, be a younger person, both physiologically and um, neurologically, because they have lef- less information in the body. The cells have more vibrancy. They have longer telomeres. You can uh, see these things in um, this meditation research. You know, Harvard did epigenetic studies showing that when you el- elicit this relaxation response, through meditation, you get uh, changes in gene expression in areas like inflammation and metabolism, and that these effects were more robust in people that had longer uh, meditative experience. And then another thing that I found really interesting that was talked about in this book is that uh, they had higher levels of gamma activity, gamma being the highest frequency brainwave. So there's something going on in these advanced meditators where you have increased levels of gamma wave activity in the brain as measured through technologies like EEG and MEG. And, uh, you know, I've, I've theorized that that has to do with the jhana, so eliciting these uh, profound physiological responses where you enter these new meditative spaces cause a lot of spike of brain activity in the form of gamma waves, but that's just my own theory. It's not been uh, fully scientifically validated at this point. But something that you see more in the uh, advanced uh, thousand hour meditative um, practice levels that I'm trying to speed up through things like neurofeedback in in my meditation program with my clients. Um, What what they found in these people that uh, like, for instance, uh, taking uh, or asking a Buddhist monk to fly from Tibet to University of Madison where uh, Richard Davidson's lab is, uh, where he has fancy... Uh, research technology like functional MRI and uh, EEG machines, having uh, that Buddhist monk show their cognitive abilities. And this is really what you get, uh, what they talk about, like the Olympic level of meditation in which uh, the average lifetime hours of meditation in these Buddhist monks was something like 27,000 meditation hours. So really devoting their life to this practice and just having like mastery over it and just some shocking findings, a very large gamma wave uh, activity in synchrony in the brain, and not only during meditative practice, but sustained throughout the day through their normal everyday awareness. Uh, you know, these master meditators have, have described their everyday experience as just being very, very present, pristine, clear, aware, feeling of peace. There's something going on here with these gamma wave oscillations, and it's very abnormal, brainwave activity that you see in these Olympic level meditators that you don't see in the general population. And that's really what they are talking about in this book is altered traits is that like literally the brain has reshaped itself over the years through neuroplasticity into um, something that's superhuman almost. Um, They could turn and off, turn on and off these meditative states in like seconds. So if they put the EEG machine on them, Um, or the functional MRI, the changes between being in their normal state and the meditative state. So even though that they had like these gamma wave oscillation patterns in their normal state, they can increase it by a significant amount when they went into their meditation very quickly within a couple of seconds they could turn on this meditative state. Whereas, you know, mere mortals like myself take like minutes upon minutes when I'm sitting down and, you know, feeling the ground beneath my uh, legs, uh, increasing my awareness, focusing on my breath, practicing, uh, you know, feelings of gratefulness, all these things over the course of minutes to an hour, just to get into like a baseline meditative state, these, these Olympic level meditators were just able to turn that on so quickly, it's just showing how robust those uh, neural pathways within their brain really are. And then um, other findings, their brain could completely decouple from pain. So um, they would have that experiment with the, with the hot plate on top of their hand. And what they found is that, um, you know, the beginner level meditators obviously, obviously had a big profound pain response. The intermediate people at like a thousand hours of meditation were able to decouple their brains somewhat from, from the pain and tolerate it much better and decrease the levels of amygdala activity. But they did talk about this thing called anticipatory anxiety. So before the experiment would begin, even the intermediate level, people would have anticipatory anxiety, meaning a spike in blood pressure, other physiological response before they actually even had the experiment begin. 
meaning that, you know, they're human, they're normal, that they're having like a little bit of worry about this searing pain that they're about to experience. But in these Olympic level meditators, there was very little to none anticipatory anxiety when they started it. There was a little bit of a spike in amygdala activity, but they were quickly be able to sort of soften down that amygdala activity and completely decoupled their minds from what was going on in the lower motor neuron system that was trying to transmit the subjective experience of pain to their brain, but just completely blocking it out. So it was pretty amazing uh, talking about these, these people. And then there was uh, even a section about uh, brain and heart coherence where the brain would enter this alpha state and the heart would have more, cohort, more uh, coherent um, heart, rate, heart rate variability patterns to where this loving uh, kindness meditation actually through the neurocircuitry, th th from the brain, the sympathetic nervous system feeding into the heart rate had a big effect on the actual heart rate and like these different uh, patterns in the brain and the heart seem to sync up in a way and I thought that was amazing uh, and they found that much more pronounced in the advanced meditators and that has actually made me more curious about uh, different products like heart math that I want to review pretty soon and then also gamma wave oscillations um, a couple of people have reached out to me online so far about uh, tracking gamma wave oscillations with the muse headband because the the gamma wave um, readings seem to be indicative of these higher level meditative processes. So it's something definitely to look more into as we increase our understanding of what we can see with the Muse headband. And I touched on this a little bit in my previous video, but I just wanted to rehash this since we're on the, on the topic. Isn't it cool that these uh, advanced meditators have such an amazing uh, ability to control their, their brain, their neurology, their physiology with their minds? I think it's simply amazing and what's cool is uh, as our technology becomes smaller, more portable, more mobile, more uh, effective, we can get a better and better understanding of what's going on in these Olympic meditator brains. You don't have to take the, Buddha, the poor Buddhist monk uh, from his perfectly uh, happy state in Tibet and fly them thousands of miles to a place like uh, University of, of Madison, which is it's cool. I hope they enjoy the trip. but. You know, not all of them are going to make that trip. Rather, take the technology to them. Uh, I, I recently interviewed um, Dr. Creek Olson, who works at University of Victoria that does work with Buddhist monks and measures their EEG brainwaves. And what he's able to do now is take uh, devices like the Muse headband up to Tibet to these Buddhist monasteries and measure multiple uh, monks with this technology and gather invaluable brainwave data. He's doing it uh, later this year. Uh, rather than in the past, he wouldn't have really been able to do that. He said himself, if you would have told him at the beginning of his graduate level training that uh, you could take EEG up to a place like that and get readings, he would have laughed because like the, the hardware was so big, you couldn't just pack it up there. So uh, it's amazing what's happening right now with our neurotechnology and um, really um, building the link between what we've known for some time of like people have these incredible cognitive abilities and studying that for science and learning how the rest of us mere, mortal, more, mere mortals like myself can learn from that. And um, I think that as the technology uh, improves like near-infrared spectroscopy and as our neurofeedback and neurostimulation technology improves, we can actually speed up that uh, meditative practice to where we can, be, or we can induce more neuroplasticity in our adult brains to rewire them in the way that these Buddhist monks have so diligently done over decades of meditative practice. Maybe we can you know, speed up the process a little bit so that we can get there a little bit quicker and not all of us have to you know, sit there hours a day meditating to get these incredible cognitive uh, capabilities. Uh, I'll be doing reviews on Halo Neuroscience pretty soon, which is a uh, headset that uses direct neuronal stimulation to activate the motor cortex. It's a very interesting thing that we could apply to meditation. And then also um, other things like you know, mind lift, which is having the audio feedback, uh, sorry, mind lift, which is having the visual feedback to train different uh, brainwave patterns that I do with my clients. And then uh, the Muse meditation training, which actually applies machine learning to those brainwave patterns of those Buddhist monks and uh, creates more robust classifiers within the data to help train the software program to give you audio feedback to tell you whether or not you're doing it right to accelerate the process. Just super awesome stuff that's going on right now. 
So that's all I had for today. If you guys are interested in doing this training with me, head to www.techforsyke.com slash coaching. Really appreciate everybody's uh, support. Talk to you again next time soon.